the triumph of truth over hysteria, of science over fear-mongering, and of fact over fiction. But more importantly, it is about people, you people, rising up to say we, we the people, want to heal ourselves. And it appears that you have been heard not only by your senator and your premier, but judging by the poll that Helen talked about yesterday by the people of Australia. As you know, you will meet with resistance, but I believe that you will prevail because you not only have the truth on your side, but the compassion of humanity. In some way, I feel a kinship with the people of Tamworth. Like you, I grew up in a rural market center in an uh, agricultural area. It was in northern Wisconsin, not in Australia. It was the largest community for 100 miles in three directions and 60 miles in the fourth. It had all of 6,500 people. The people in my hometown were by and large decent people who cared about other people in the community. And that's the sense I get from the time that I have spent here in Tamworth. Lastly, in this introduction, I want to mention the power of the human spirit and its capacity for healing. Back in the 1980s, I think it was, there were uh, a physician couple, they were married to each other at UCLA, called the Symingtons, who studied the possible power and impact of visioning on the course of cancer. The cancer that they studied was uh, gallbladder cancer. And they told people, we want you to envision your white blood cells attacking the cancer. And what they found was is that, uh, and this was a serious cancer, that the people who were the control group, that their average life expectancy was nine months. And the people who did the visioning, their average life expectancy was 13 months. Now, four months may not seem like a lot, but I'm guessing if it's you, it is a hell of a lot. And in addition to extending uh, the person's uh, lifespan, uh, the people who participated in the visioning process uh, also had a better quality of life, uh, uh, less uh, depression, and dealt with their illness in a better, more uh, positive way. Um, and because I think that this is important and that it gives strength and hope, I ask you uh, to give a large round of applause for Lucy and Lou's son, Dan, to infuse him with your hope and support. So can I hear that applause? No, we need stronger applause. I'm sure that Dan felt that, and I'm also sure that it will add strength and resolve as he fights his disease. Before I start into my talk, I uh, want to uh, delve into the shameless commerce division here and uh, tell you that I have a new book, as I say, hold up book, um, and it's in two volumes. Volume one is hot off the press, and I have a few copies here, and it goes from 2637 BC through 1969. Uh, and I, volume two will be coming out around the first of the year, and we're going to launch an international marketing campaign at that, at that time. I'll be uh, putting some brochures about the book uh, uh, out in the lobby. Uh, you can pick them up if you want at uh, the break, and also we'll have a few books that I brought along uh, that I hope you'll buy because they're heavy and I don't want to carry them back to the United States. Um, volume two uh, is more about uh, medicinal cannabis, uh, the endocannabinoid system, uh, the constituents of the plant, uh, a critique of uh, uh, drug policy around the world, uh, but largely in the United States, and some suggestions on how to uh, straighten things out. And 
why I think uh, that would be uh, helpful, the, the, the benefits that we would have from having drug policy reform. Because as we know, the drug war is an abject failure. Uh, that's a, another lecture, and I won't uh, uh, you know, go into that at, at, the, uh, at the present time. Lastly, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. Uh, we were founded to try to make as professional a face as possible for the specialty of cannabinoid medicine. We wanted to recognize those physicians who were practicing cannabinoid medicine in a responsible, uh, serious, and professional manner. And we also wanted to marginalize those physicians who are practicing minimalist medicine uh, without uh, having the medical boards beat them over the head. So I would certainly invite uh, any healthcare professionals from Australia who would like to uh, support us in uh, America. I also have some uh, brochures for that uh, that will be uh, out uh, on the, uh, uh, in the lobby. Uh, finally, I want to um, mention that if you want a copy of my slides, uh, I, my email will be up on the screen at the end of this. You can email me and I will email you a copy of my slides. Now, let's, where do I, how do I move this thing forward? Hit the start button. Okay, so we're going to uh, uh, talk uh, a little bit about the history, a little bit about the current situation, and then what the uh, future holds. And um, the one of the things that uh, I sense from uh, some of the hostility uh, regarding organized medicine yesterday is not new. Uh, it goes back uh, millennia. Voltaire said, uh, and I think it was the 18th century, doctors put drugs of which they know little into bodies of which they know less for diseases of which they know nothing at all. And what, what I'm hopeful is that what you heard yesterday and what you will hear today um, will show that we've made at least a little bit of progress uh, in rectifying all three of those things, uh, but we're certainly not there yet. There's no question about that. This is just a little bit of my uh, background. I think one of the things that uh, I, I don't uh, have on there is I did work for the United States Public Health Service for a couple of years. Um, I'm a minor league politician uh, in my community. Uh, I uh, serve on the lowest possible elected body, uh, the sewer board, uh, which I recommend to anybody that wants to go into politics because it's not particularly controversial. Uh, now, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I got my start in interest in drugs uh, because my father was a pharmacist. So uh, for the first 25, 27 years of my life, I often walked into a building that had a 13-foot uh, sign on it saying drugs. And so as far as I'm concerned, drugs are a good thing. Drugs help pay for me to go to college. Uh, and I, I think that's why I can take, uh, hopefully, a fair and reasonable view of uh, cannabis as a, uh, a uh, medication. So I'm hoping that uh, We'll give you a little bit of history on, on cannabis as a medicine. Uh, I don't want to go into that in, in great depth because I think it's more important to, uh, to get to the present. And I do want to talk about how uh, med medicinal cannabis uh, is practiced uh, in the United States, uh, tell you a little bit about what I think the current policy issues are, uh, talk about uh, some research, uh, and uh, discuss where we go from here. Okay, and this just repeats what I uh, just uh, just told you. So we've got 23 states in the United States where cannabis is legal. Uh, I don't want to go into a long discussion of constitutional law, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the federal government has no authority to control the practice of medicine in the United States. 
So why is cannabis illegal in the United States? That's because by a uh, bizarre uh, twist of a 1942 uh, United States Supreme Court decision, uh, they're not controlling uh, the practice of medicine, they're controlling interstate commerce. Uh, in a decision in 2004, uh, they ruled that if you grew marijuana in your backyard and smoked it in your living room, uh, that affected interstate commerce. More insanity. So this is just to let you know that there were lots of people in the United States uh, whose doctors had made recommendations for the medicinal use of cannabis. Uh, the numbers here have gone up probably exponentially uh, in the last two years because of the changing attitudes that are going on in the U.S., uh, which are not too dissimilar from the changing attitudes that you've seen here in Australia uh, in the last six months. So, as I said, uh, I'm a, a history buff, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all 395 pages here uh, because we'd be here well in the next week and just going to hit a, a, a minute or two on uh, some of the uh, history. Uh, cannabis uh, presumably goes back to at least 2637 BC when according to Chinese oral history, the second emperor of China, who may in fact be mythical, uh, wrote the first pharmacopoeia and it contained uh, cannabis. And cannabis has been in every major pharmacopoeia ever since 2637 BC. And it was used in ancient times for many things. Some of the things it was used for were as an analgesic, a childbirth anesthetic, treating migraines, indigestion, and insomnia. And we still use cannabis for these indications today. As has been told to you before, uh, Dr. W.B. O'Shaughnessy uh, discovered uh, cannabis being used as a medicine in India. Uh, they have the oldest uh, uh, hard copy, and I think it's written on stone, so it is a hard copy, uh, of uh, Pharmacopoeia, uh, and that also contains uh, cannabis, and it's dated somewhere between uh, 1100 and uh, 1700 B.C. So... Um, he first, uh, being uh, a good physician and a good scientist, uh, took a look at its effect on animals and then took a look of, at its effect on, on people. And he brought that back to England and, as was said, it soon caught on uh, elsewhere. Uh, actually, the uh, French had the most literature about uh, cannabis as a medicine in the 19th century. Uh, they had uh, brought back uh, cannabis uh, from uh, their wars in Egypt in the early 1800s. Uh, Napoleon's soldiers and the physicians uh, brought that back to France. The United States Pharmacopoeia, the USP, is uh, not a governmental uh, body, but it's a uh, a private organization, and they have a compendium of commonly used medications. And cannabis was in the United States Pharmacopoeia uh, from 1854 until 1942. So, again, uh, it's been mentioned that uh, cannabis uh, had a good deal of popularity in the uh, 19th century, uh, that uh, there was uh, a... Uh, historically noted uh, conference uh, in by the Ohio State Medical Society in 1860. Uh, the first issue of The Lancet uh, had an article about cannabis written by uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was uh, the Queen's uh, uh, physician, uh, discussing the utility of cannabis. And of course, he did prescribe it uh, to um, the Queen Victoria for her menstrual uh, cramps. Uh, Patent medicines were extremely big uh, in the 19th century, and uh, cannabis was one of the most commonly used uh, ingredients in patent medicines, uh, right after alcohol and opium. And all of them had some uh, medicinal value. So it, until aspirin came along, it was probably the third most commonly used uh, medication, certainly in the United States. Sir William Osler, uh, it was considered the father of modern medicine. Uh, he wrote uh, what's considered to be the first textbook of internal medicine, and in that he said that cannabis was the best treatment for migraine headaches, and that too uh, remains true uh, to today. 
in the 1920s, uh, you had a number of cigarettes that were used to treat asthma. Uh, there was not only uh, the Grimaldi here, but you had uh, Cigars de Joy uh, in uh, France, and Canadana, uh, which was uh, produced here in Australia. And uh, cannabis is both a uh, anti-inflammatory and a bronchodilator, much like, I don't know if Adbear is uh, a drug that's sold here, but it's widely advertised in the United States, and that too is a bronchodilator uh, and an anti-inflammatory. So it's perfectly reasonable uh, that this would be good for uh, treating asthma. Now, plant-based medicines are where pharmacy started. Uh, we went to uh, visit our daughter when she had her junior year abroad uh, in Spain, and they had a, a giant room that was the apothecary uh, where they made medicines out of uh, herbal products. And herbal products unfortunately began to uh, fall out of favor in the early 1900s. Uh, but still in the 1920s, American physicians wrote 3 million prescriptions a year uh, that contained cannabis. And in 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, and I'll talk about that in just a few seconds, there were still 28 products on the market that were over-the-counter preparations. You didn't need a prescription for them. Um, and it seems to me that it would be appropriate for us to return to the wisdom of our forefathers and have both prescription uh, cannabis and over-the-counter uh, cannabis uh, in terms of uh, medicinal use. Now, I'm not sure how much the greed of the pharmaceutical companies figures into uh, the obstructionism. I uh, tend to think that it's the greed of the petrochemical companies uh, as well as certainly in the United States institutionalized racism. Uh, but the major pharmaceutical companies were able to make money uh, off of products uh, that were cannabis, powdered cannabis, whole leaf cannabis, tincture cannabis, uh, Names that may be familiar to you, Eli Lee, Squibb, Merck, Sharp and Dome, Smith Brothers, they all had numerous forms of uh, cannabis that were uh, available. And then cannabis went from uh, being a popular drug to sort of being a pariah. And why did that happen? And there were a number of reasons why that happened, but one of the things was what I call the cult of modernism. And we believe that there's been enormous change in the last 30 years, but just think if you had lived in 1914, uh, the changes that would have taken place in the 30 years before that. And I think that the, the, the change from the relatively, uh, uh, primitive is a wrong word, but uh, the, the, the change from the slightly industrialized 19th century to the uh, remarkable inventions of the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, people felt they were really uh, vastly different and more civilized than uh, their parents and their uh, grandparents. And one of the things that went by the wayside was herbal medicine. Manufactured medication started in the 1890s, and they were the new thing. They were the big thing. And we all remember how we rejected our parents as being old-fashioned, or how our children reject us as being old-fashioned. Uh, and I think this was the same thing with the uh, physicians of, uh, of that era. And so you begin to see a decline uh, in the use of uh, herbal-based medicines uh, starting in the late 1920s, for sure. Uh, one of the other things that happened was that medicine was poorly regulated uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And you had something called the Flexner Report uh, that came out in 1910. And that tended to elevate allopathic uh, physicians, uh, which I am, and I mean, I'm a, that's just the fact, uh, and it, it marginalized uh, naturopaths, osteopaths, and homeopaths, and all of those uh, uh, professional genres were much more favorably disposed to herbal medicine so that the herbal medicine lost uh, some of their uh, champions uh, that were uh, uh, out there that could say, hey, this stuff is, is, uh, is worthwhile. One other thing that's uh, important to recognize is that 
the Marijuana Tax Act was uh, an important instrument, not only in the United States, but in influencing drug policy around the world because of the um, influence of the United States, our ability to bully other countries or bribe them uh, through foreign aid. Uh, and the Marijuana Tax Act, as I'll talk about in a minute, had nothing to do with marijuana and everything to do uh, with hemp. And that's where uh, Schlichten's decorticator come in, came, comes in. He patented it in 1916, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1916 uh, issued a report saying hemp is going to make a comeback and recognized that hemp was the most profitable agricultural plant in the world for a 1,000 years until 1880. So they weren't just whistling Dixie, as the uh, saying goes. Um, then you also had Harry Anslinger, who is often fingered as the villain in this piece. Uh, I tend to think that uh, Lamont DuPont was more the villain in the piece, and that Anslinger was just an opportunist. He was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. I think he was the greatest bureaucrat of all time because he created a problem where none existed so that he could increase his bureaucracy. And any of you who've been a bureaucrat, and I've been a bureaucrat for half my life, know that the, the mark of a good bureaucrat is to have a big budget uh, and uh, control a lot of people. I say that with tongue firmly in cheek. Uh, now, we don't have any smoking gun on Mr. DuPont, uh, and I won't go into uh, why he was concerned about competition from hemp other than it competed with tetraethyl lead, sulfites are making paper, rayon, nylon. Uh, DuPont was the largest shareholder in General Motors and Ford was making a car that ran on hemp and was made all out, of, uh, out of hemp. And so you begin to have propaganda uh, in the, the uh, 1930s uh, trying to uh, scare people. Um, okay, so let me move along here to the prohibition propaganda. One of the things I didn't notice about this poster, it, you'll notice that they're injecting marijuana. Um, I doubt whether people here have injected marijuana. Uh, there actually have been some studies where they injected THC, and uh, they found that that had a pretty profound effect on people. But um, most folks don't do that uh, unless you are some kind of quasi-scientist uh, or maybe deranged scientist. Uh, in the U.S., as elsewhere, drug policy has been used to marginalize, discriminate against groups. You'll notice that the gentleman here, somebody pointed that out to me, he's actually uh, an African-American, and I didn't originally notice that. So you get that in there and the sort of sexual overtones uh, that go along with uh, re uh, discriminatory and restrictive uh, drug policy. Uh, Reefer Madness was a, a movie that became popular again in the late 60s and early 70s. It was often used as fundraisers by the National Organization for Reform of Marijuana Laws, where students at places like Berkeley would get stoned and go and laugh and uh, enjoy the incredible inconsistency with reality that uh, Reefer Madness uh, showed. And they're often uh, in demonizing drugs, and certainly in, in de there's no difference with uh, cannabis. Uh, it's associated with uh, wanton sexuality. So the Marijuana Tax Act, uh, the American Medical Association testified against it. And in their testimony against it, they said uh, that they were upset because in the two years that it had been uh, developed in secret, they had not been contacted. And Dr. Woodward uh, was a public health person. He was past president of the American Public Health Association. He said he knew of no dangers, and the AMA knew of no dangers from the medical use of cannabis. And that was at a time that it had been in the United States Pharmacopeia since 1854. And then he said, you know, I contacted the Bureau of Prisons, the Children's Bureau, uh, the United States Public Health Service, and not one of them had one iota of evidence backing up Mr. Einslinger's outrageous claims. And if you want to see some interesting reading, uh, Google the testimony of Dr. William C. Woodward before uh, the House Ways and Means Committee. And how do I back this thing up? Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Got it. 
Okay, so cannabis was available in pharmacies until 1942. And I did want to mention a story that my father uh, told me. Uh, we were talking about alcohol prohibition uh, around 1959 or 1960. And he said, you know, when I was a freshman at the University of Minnesota School of Pharmacy in 1928, one of our assignments was to make tincture cannabis. And we had to be very careful uh, because the alcohol was illegal. <laughs> now. This tells you something. And by the way, I looked up in his Remington's textbook of pharmacy, and there on page 999 and 1000, it tells you how to make tincture of cannabis and that it's useful as an anodyne, which is an archaic word for painkiller, and as a tranquilizer. And I'm certain that my father filled prescriptions that called for cannabis because he was a pharmacist in the 1920s and 1930s, and doctors were writing 3 million prescriptions a year uh, that contained cannabis. In 1942, the year after cannabis was taken out of the United States Pharmacopeia, because its use had fallen off as a result of the cumbersomeness of the Marijuana Tax Act uh, and also the cult of modernism that I mentioned earlier, uh, Morris Fishbein, uh, who had been the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association for many years and was seen as the voice of the American Medical Association, reiterated what Osler had said, that cannabis was one of the best treatments for migraine headaches. So, as I say, uh, in 1941, that was the last year that uh, cannabis was in the United States Pharmacopeia. Um, Flash forward uh, to uh, the Nixon administration. Uh, Richard Nixon, while he started the war on drugs, actually had the most liberal policy since the war on drugs started. 75% of his budget went for drug treatment as opposed to uh, the criminal activities. Uh, and uh, he had uh, Jerome Jaffe as the drug czar, who was the most qualified uh, person to ever hold that uh, uh, position. Uh, the only other good thing I can say about Nixon is he liked ketchup on scrambled eggs. Uh, he, he did give a um, special uh, investigative uh, badge to Elvis Presley. And as we know, Presley died from an a overdose of prescription drugs, and it's ironic that he got this special DEA uh, badge. So the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 uh, made cannabis a Schedule I drug, a drug that has no known medical use and has a high uh, propensity for danger, uh, both of which, of course, are not true. Uh, that act also directed the formulation of a commission to study drug abuse in marijuana, the Nixon Marijuana Commission. And they recommended that small amounts of marijuana be legalized. And had that happened, I, I would not have had this trip to Australia, but I think that uh, it would have been a small price to pay uh, not to have arrested uh, seven or 800,000 Americans over the years and not to have created the drug war. Probably the people who are suffering the most from the drug war are the people in uh, Central America and South America where the drug cartels uh, are killing tens of thousands of people a year then all we have to do is reform our drug laws and that would stop. So now we start moving to the present. And I got a kick out of Sanjay Gupta in that even in his apology, he didn't really understand how little he knew. Uh, and I'm grateful for uh, Dr. Uh, Gupta uh, for his uh, documentary. But he said, in talking about seizures, that the research went back to the 1970s. Actually, the research, as you uh, heard yesterday, goes back to the 1500s, but the modern research goes back to 1947, and then it was written about in 1949. And the recommendation of Ramsey and Davis was that more research should be done on non-institutionalized people, and their recommendation was followed some 65 years later, a little bit slow on the, uh, on the uptake. Um, 1954, the uh, semi-official uh, medical military journal in the United States, uh, Military uh, Medicine, uh, their editor wrote an editorial called The Marijuana Bugaboo Revisited. He'd previously written a editorial in 1943 called The Marijuana Bugaboo, both of which were highly critical of the Marijuana Tax Act. 
I want to talk a little bit about Bob Randall and the Independent New Drug Program. Uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, uh, report in 1999 is important, uh, but also probably more important is the uh, House of Lords report in 1997, which really was the impetus for GW Pharmaceuticals, which branded their pharmaceutical company, but they've done a lot of research with cannabis. I mean. Their product is cannabis. I don't care what anybody says. It's tincture cannabis that comes from the plant. It's sort of uh, uh, cannabis uh, with a uh, special certificate, uh, uh, high-class uh, cannabis, if you will, or, or certified cannabis. There's nothing particularly special about it except it's standardized. So uh, a fellow named Bob Randall, and there's uh, Mr. Randall, he uh, was going blind from glaucoma, and nothing worked. And he got arrested for growing marijuana. He'd found that the marijuana uh, helped relieve some of his symptoms. And he had a legal proceeding with the government in which they agreed to give a researcher at Johns Hopkins cannabis to stop him from going blind, which he did. Uh, but then the researcher got promoted uh, and got a full professorship at another university, and the government had to figure out some other way to get Mr. Randall his cannabis. They sent him 300 uh, one gram or nine tenths of a gram uh, cannabis cigarettes every month. And uh, they said, but don't tell anybody about this. And of course, he went out and told as many people as he could. Uh, and uh, fairly soon, there were 15 people in the program. There were 35 people on the waiting list. And in 1989, he addressed uh, a group of, of uh, AIDS patients in San Francisco. And I've heard number anywhere between 300 and 1,000 people applied to get into the program. And so the response to that was not to say, gee, this stuff might be useful. It was to say, oh, wow, we have to do something because if we put this many people on the program, and this is almost a direct quote, people will get the wrong idea. They might think that marijuana is good for you, which it is, of course. Um, in 1985, the uh, federal government approved Marinol, which is THC. That's the most euphorogenic uh, compound in uh, cannabis and the government did this so that they could tell people who had AIDS who were using cannabis uh, to relieve their neuropathic pain and uh, uh, to give them an appetite because their appetite was being suppressed by the uh, antiviral drugs that they were getting uh, that here we have something for you. Now cannabis has 483 compounds in it, Marinol has one and yet the the government would have you, have you believe that Marinol is prescription uh, cannabis. It's not. It's THC. And I am the number one prescriber of Marinol in my county, and I tell people this is more expensive, has more side effects, and doesn't work as well as marijuana, but you can get it at a regular drugstore. And because of the stigma that's associated with cannabis, there are a lot of people that go ahead and get the Marinol. And this just shows you what I just said, the difference between Marinol and uh, cannabis. And of course, we know that there are a number of different cannabinoids as well as terpenes in the plant that have therapeutic and medicinal value. And here's the, uh, the quote from uh, Dr. Mason, who was the acting Surgeon General, saying we have to uh, get rid of this program because people will get, quote, the wrong idea, end quote. So let's talk about uh, modern uh, medicine. We had a lot of modern research. I'm going to just skip this slide. Uh, I already told you about Ramsey and Davis and the uh, uh, epilepsy. And you've heard uh, plenty, and as you should, about Dr. Mishulam uh, and his uh, characterization of the structure of Delta 9 THC. A uh, person that you haven't heard about who is very important in the United States was Dr. Todd Micaria. He passed away a few years ago of liver cancer. He's a psychiatrist. He, in 1968, uh, was uh, worked for the National Institute of Mental Health, and he selected uh, marijuana research grants. Uh, this was a marriage made in hell. He had read all of the India Hemp Commission report. It's got uh, 
you know, something like 3,300 pages in eight volumes, and realized that cannabis had therapeutic value. And so he was looking for research projects that demonstrated the therapeutic value. Uh, the federal government was looking for research projects that demonstrated uh, that marijuana was a tool of the devil. So that didn't last for very long. Uh, he was the co-author of Prop 215, and basically as a result of that became a target of the federal government as well as the Medical Board of California. So let's talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system. You've already heard a lot about it, so we won't talk too much about it. Uh, it uh, it's modulation of sensory input. It has to do with uh, homeostasis. Uh, other uh, constituents that you haven't heard about uh, are dopamine and a phenomenon called a retrograde inhibition. We have the CB1 receptors, we have the CB2 receptors, and there are probably two or three other receptors uh, that will be discovered within the next few years. So we got the CB1 receptor, CB2 receptors, we have anandamide, we have 2-AG, and then there are the enzymes that break down uh, these uh, endocannabinoids, uh, FA and MYGYL. And uh, Dr. Daniel Piamelli at UC Irvine is working on a compound that will interfere with uh, these enzymes. He reasons that if the phytochemicals are good for you, the endocannabinoids have to be even better. And so if he can keep the endocannabinoids around by inhibiting uh, their breakdown, that that therapeutically may be better than uh, the phytochemicals, which doesn't mean that the phytochemicals are bad for you or that they're not good for you or that they don't do anything. It just means that here's a physician uh, or researcher who thinks that uh, he may have uh, something, another way of looking at this. So the important thing about the um, cannabinoid receptor sites in the brain is that you don't have any in the brain stem, and that's why no one has ever died from an overdose of cannabis. In a speech that I gave at Denver a couple of months ago, I made a joke that the most dangerous thing uh, about cannabis is if you drop a 1,000 pounds of marijuana in the hind leg of a rat, you'll break his leg. And one of the people in the audience uh, uh, berated uh, that joke as saying, uh, th that's not research. Yes, I know it's not research. It's a joke. Uh, okay. So retrograde inhibition, basically uh, what that means is that instead of the neurotransmission going in one direction, that it comes backwards from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic neuron going retrograde, the neurotransmitter, the anandamide or the 2-AG, and it causes the release of dopamine, and dopamine depolarizes the cell, making it more difficult for the next neurotransmission to come along. Now, you can see where that would be beneficial in somebody with migraine headaches or seizures, which is caused by an excessive amount of neural stimulation. So if you can put the brakes on neural stimulation, slow down the speed of neural stimulation, then you're going to decrease the severity or maybe even prevent migraines, and you're going to decrease the frequency of uh, seizures. So let's talk a little bit about the plant. Uh, you have already heard it's 483 chemicals. And the number of cannabinoids, I've seen a variety of uh, numbers, uh, 66, 80, more than 100. Let's just say there's lots of cannabinoids in there. Uh, and there's more than 100 terpenes, and there's phenoids, and there's flavonoids. And Dr. Mishulam uh, says that he thinks that these work in concert. He calls it the entourage effect. Uh, you heard Dr. Grinspoon use uh, his term for it. And this uh, slide, I think, is really crucial. It's really critical. Uh, it is a mistake to extract THC from the plant and expect it to work the same way the plant does. It is a mistake to extract CBD from the plant and expect it to work the way the plant does. And. I will accept that applause uh, in the name of the plant. Uh, the, the, the cannabinoids, we, we know something about THC. We know something about CBD. 
we're beginning to find out some things about CBG and CBC, but there are several other cannabinoids that also have therapeutic value. I mean, the, the amount of research yet to be done is exciting. However, that's no excuse for not moving forward on the basis of the uh, research and the human experience that we have already. I mean, 10,000 years should be long enough. So the other interesting thing is that it's not just the cannabinoids. The terpenes have a role. Now, this is something that I want to learn more about. Uh, I'm sure there are people in the audience. I know Mara Gordon knows a lot more about terpenes than I do, and maybe she'll mention something about it in her talk, so I'll learn something. But I, I remember reading an article by Ed Rosenthal. Some of you who grow your own uh, marijuana may be familiar with him. He's written a lot of books on growing marijuana. And he said, if you have, and he's talking about recreational marijuana, although uh, he has been involved in the medical marijuana movement as well. And he said, if you have low-grade cannabis and you want to use it recreationally to get high, uh, what you should do is eat a mango uh, about an hour before you smoke your marijuana, and it will give you a bigger high. And mangoes have uh, a terpene called murine in there. Well, we need to have an Ed Rosenthal who's going to look at the medicinal aspects of cannabis, and that may be Mira Gordon. I don't know. Maybe uh, Mira will, will write a book on that, and people like you and I can go out and buy it and uh, learn more about the terpenes. Whoop. Uh -oh. Excuse me. All right. So the entourage effect is the combination of the cannabinoids, the terpenes, and the flavonoids. The flavonoids are what give it uh, cannabis its color. And as I say, uh, Meshulam postulated this in 1999, and now there are a number of other people uh, who are knowledgeable in this that agree that this is uh, an important contributor to the therapeutic effects of cannabis. As I mentioned uh, earlier, the 1997 House of Lords report was uh, important. My understanding is, uh, and I may be wrong on this, is, but that it came about because members of the House of Lords were concerned that a disproportionate number of people being arrested for possession of marijuana in England uh, were uh, people that had multiple sclerosis. And so this is a nice thing to look at, a nice report. It's about 20 pages long. And it paved the way for GW Pharmaceuticals, the makers of Sativex, uh, to do research. Oh, by the way, I, as a disclaimer, I do have some stock in GW Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how minimal it is, uh, uh, but anyway, I do. Uh, so they started doing research on this. And the thing that I like about referring to GW is this isn't like Marinol, where it's a synthetic THC. This is marijuana. It's tincture cannabis, uh, and they take the flowering tops of uh, a strain of cannabis and put it in alcohol, leave it there for a specified period of time, strain off the plant material, and they're left with alcohol that's infused with this cannabinoid. And they do that with two different strains. They mix them one-to-one, -one, and you're getting all of the cannabinoids that are in the plant. And one of these plants is high in THC, one of the plants is high in CBD. They're also looking at other uh, strains as well. Uh, and it's legal in, uh, it's being marketed in 15 countries in the world, and it's legal in another 12 countries in the world. And I don't think that we're seeing any adverse effects from this. There's that effect. Available in Canada since 2005, available in the European Union since 2010. And there's an a enormous amount of therapeutic uses of cannabis. I mean, that's why you're here. That's what you're, you're interested in. Okay. 
So these are some of the many therapeutic uses. Let me just move to a little bit easier to read slide. It's an anti-nauseant. It can stop you from vomiting, appetite stimulant. We had studies in seven or eight different states in the 1970s and 1980s. They all demonstrated that. It's an analgesic. That's the number one reason for recommending cannabis. It's a sleep aid. Uh, bedtime is the number one time for taking cannabis. It's an anti-seizure medication, anti-inflammatory, tranquilizer, muscle relaxant, antidepressant, sleep aid, PTS, PTSD treatment, ADD, ADHD treatment, and as has been mentioned here, it kills cancer cells. Now, this is sort of my best guess uh, a while back of the top six conditions or symptoms uh, which uh, people use cannabis for uh, in my practice. Relief of pain to help them sleep, uh, anti-nauseant uh, for arthritis uh, and other connected tissue and autoimmune diseases, uh, migraines, and anxiety. And these are all common conditions, so that's why they're in the top six, and that's why some of the more exotic things are not on the list. Um, there's a uh, physician who was a surgeon, uh, Tom O'Connell, who said, Anybody who uses marijuana must have ADD. Now, uh, ADD uh, is uh, unfortunately relatively common. Uh, anywhere from 5 to 15% of people have it. Uh, and oftentimes people feel uh, different and feel uncomfortable and, and feel stupid. It turns out that most people with ADD are smarter than average uh, and that ADD allows you to multitask and has a lot of benefits. Uh, it can be treated with uh, sympathomimetic drugs, uh, you know, Ritalin, Dexedrine, uh, but they have untoward side effects. So a lot of people have found that cannabis provides the same or better relief as the sympathomimetic drugs and doesn't have any side effects or doesn't have near the side effects. And then some people use the cannabis in conjunction with the sympathomimetic drugs. So you've heard seizures mentioned, you've heard glaucoma mentioned. Here's some more... Uh, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, fibromyalgia, and so forth. Uh, peripheral neuropathy is a kind of pain. One of the things that doesn't get mentioned a lot is Crohn's disease, and I was, participated in a little study with Dr. Hergenrather and Dr. Micaria, uh, and uh, people were able to had fewer stools, they had better form stools, many of them were able to stop taking steroids. Uh, very uh, helpful. A cyclical vomiting syndrome, I had never heard of that until I started doing medicinal cannabis, and it's sometimes referred to as an abdominal migraine. And post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, it is criminal uh, what the United States government has done in terms of uh, ignoring uh, the treatment of PTSD of uh, American uh, warriors. So, as Dr. Resnick mentioned, there's a lot of mental health problems that uh, can be, uh, uh, the symptoms can be treated, they can be made less uh, by the use of cannabis. And uh, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, um, stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder. Uh, Dr. Piamelli that I mentioned earlier in his research with animals talks about bipolar disorder, attention deficit disorder, Tourette's syndrome, uh, and panic attacks as being responsive uh, to cannabis. One of the other things that I've been impressed with is its use for uh, kids that have trouble with adjustment, uh, autism, Asperger's, social anxiety disorder. Uh, and I, because my concern about the Medical Board of California, who in my opinion are incompetent, and uh, I mean, I was the medical director of the Medi-Cal Managed Care Program in Santa Barbara for 14 years, and part of my responsibility was quality of care. And so uh, I, I know what I'm talking about when I talk about quality of care. Uh, I won't go into anything further why I think the medical board is incompetent, but I do. Uh, anyway, I, I don't usually see children, but I've had parents that have said, as some of you parents are, there's nothing. I'm at the end of my rope. What can I do? 
There was a woman that wrote a book called Jeffrey's Journey, uh, whose son had adjustment problems and he'd been thrown out of schools and he, there was a list of the medications he'd taken, which was as long as your arm. And she said, I voted against Proposition 215. Proposition 215 legalized the medical use of marijuana in California in 1996. And she finally ended up giving her son that and she was astonished at the change in the boy. He was able to get along with people. He stopped fighting with people. Well, you heard the presentations uh, yesterday about that. And that's what I've seen uh, with uh, children uh, with autism, with Asperger's, uh, people with attention deficit disorder. Uh, the AIDS, I think it's uh, well known because it's an antidepressant. It uh, uh, you know, treats the neuropathic pain, stimulates the appetite. Benefits to cancer patients, uh, you've heard an awful lot about that. And, you know, one of the reasons that many of you are here is because of the last item, the anti-proliferative uh, effect, that is, that it kills cancer cells. And we know that from both animal experience and uh, a substantial number of anecdotes uh, regarding human beings. And as Dr. Don Abrams, I think I have a slide later on that quotes him, he said there's more than enough uh, evidence from basic science studies and anecdotes to warrant double-blind studies. And again, that is another uh, black mark uh, for the United States uh, because we have known that cannabis kills cancer cells in the United States since 1974. And that seems to be like a little bit too cautious to me uh, to wait uh, for doing double-blind studies. Um, the ADD, I think, is caused by what has been referred to as an endocannabinoid deficiency. And that uh, the endocannabinoids and dopamine are uh, distributed on a bell-shaped curve. So some people are going to have more than others. It's not a flat line. We don't all have the same amount of every neurotransmitter. We have different amounts. Just like we're different heights and different weights, we have different amounts of the neurotransmitters. And so if you're don't have enough dopamine, or if you have too much dopamine transporter, or you don't have enough anandamide, whatever, your, neur your neural impulses may move very rapidly. And what happens is, is that it sort of overwhelms uh, the frontal cortex. And you take cannabis, and, it's, and the retrograde inhibition kicks in, you slow down the speed of neurotransmission, and you can focus, you can concentrate. I was being interviewed um, by a reporter for USA Today. Uh, we were talking about migraines, and uh, it came about as a result of uh, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar being stopped for marijuana and he was, uh, possession, and he had, had migraines. And uh, the waitress came over, because what usually happens when reporters talk to me is they start telling me about their experiences with marijuana when they were in college. Uh, and so we were laughing and having a good time and all that sort of stuff. And the waitress came over and said, my 17-year-old son, she just volunteered this, noticed after six months of using marijuana that he was better able to focus and concentrate and do his homework and his grades went up. And by the way, that happens all the time. I mean, I've seen that with many patients. Post-traumatic stress disorder, you heard uh, from Dr. Resnick. Uh, he mentioned it somewhat in passing, but uh, I'm sure that he has even more dramatic stories than I uh, have seen. Uh, but I uh, had one patient who lived um, 20 miles outside of a place called Bishop, California. If you've never heard of it, that's because it's just a blip on the map. And he lived in a small town, a suburb, if you will, of Bishop, California, at the end of the road. And he said, I try not to go into town more than once a month. He said, and if it wasn't for marijuana, I would start killing people. I found that to be pretty dramatic. Uh, and I have seen this gentleman now on a regular basis since then, and he no longer feels that way. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, I think, increases something called dopamine transporter, which ties up your dopamine, which speeds up your neurotransmission, which allows your midbrain, 
which is the most primitive part of the brain, and it sees things in terms of black and white, life and death, to have a larger role in your thinking than the brain was already designed for. And so rage and anger can be poorly controlled. But if you slow down the speed of neurotransmission, then you give the frontal cortex a chance to say, you know, probably I should say, I disagree with you, rather than I think you're a flaming asshole. And that uh, changes the quality of uh, a person's life. Now, we also had a study at the Max Planck Institute in Germany about 12 years ago in mice that showed that cannabis decreased uh, fearful memories. So that's probably another thing where it helps uh, PTSD and people uh, stop having nightmares. Uh, and it tends to have some effect on easy startle uh, and on being uh, hyper alert. And of course, you don't have to be a veteran of a war. You can be the veteran of growing up in a family that is dysfunctional or where you've been sexually abused or you've been physically abused or emotionally abused or one or both of your parents are substance abusers and you have PTSD because you don't know what's going to happen next and you have to always be on the alert. So, does this stuff work? Well, yes. I mean, you, that's why we're here, to tell you that it's worked. How do we know that it's worked? Well, we got 5,000 years of recorded history. Uh, we have anecdotes from our patients. We have 20,000 uh, studies. Uh, we have a, a, a tincture of cannabis legal in 27 countries. Uh, we have it legal in 23 countries, and on and on and on. So what about the side effects versus the therapeutic effects? That's always a consideration in medicine. And the thing that makes cannabis so attractive to those of us that practice cannabinoid medicine is its incredible safety profile. Now, the 1999 Institute of Medicine uh, report um, was fairly conservative and said the side effects of cannabis were no greater than those of other drugs. That is an overstatement. The chief administrative law judge of the FDA said it was one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man, and that is closer to the truth. And of course, the AMA, again, said that it knew of no dangers from the medicinal use of cannabis. So it's, it's also been found safe in all kinds of, of studies that have been done. Uh, there, there was one done in uh, South Australia in 1978. Uh, and Canada and the United States and the Indian Hemp Commission, they all recommended legalizing uh, small amounts of marijuana for recreational purposes, let alone medicinal purposes. Okay, um, oh, I went to throw that one out. Okay, so the cannabis and schizophrenia. People say, oh, cannabis causes schizophrenia. Well, there was... Um, um, a study done here in uh, Australia that showed that there's no change in the level of schizophrenia over the last 30 years, and yet there's been a fairly sharp increase in the use of cannabis. Uh, Dr. Donald Tashkin uh, is a pulmonologist. He's done a lot of research for NIDA. Uh, he thought he was going to show that ca uh, cannabis caused lung cancer. And what he showed was that cannabis did not cause lung cancer and probably prevented lung cancer, which, of course, makes sense because cannabis prevents about 15 different kinds of cancer. The American Medical Association in 2009 joined about 100 other uh, American and a few international organizations uh, calling for the legalization of cannabis as a medicine or rescheduling uh, cannabis from a Schedule One drug to at least a Schedule Two drug. It probably should be a Schedule Four or a Schedule Five drug. And we talked about the Schedule One stratus. I won't bore you with that. Uh, I won't go into the um, legal uh, situation in the States other than to talk about April Rach who had uh, meningioma, and she sued the U.S. government to get a permanent injunction against them to enjoin them from arresting her from using marijuana to save her life. 
seems reasonable. And uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, federal uh, appeals court, uh, agreed with her. And the George W. Bush administration uh, couldn't tolerate that, and they appealed the case to the United States Supreme Court. Now, this was basically a states' rights case. There are five justices on the Supreme Court at that time, and still now, different ones, but that believe in states' rights. And the most outspoken one is a guy named Anton Scalia, who deserves to be considered for the largest hypocrite uh, in the United States. Uh, he has strongly spoken out in favor of states' rights. Yet this case, which was uh, uh, the lawyer who represented uh, Ms. Raich, was a, uh, one of the most prominent libertarian uh, law professors in the United States and made it a states' rights case. And it lost six to three because two alleged conservatives, apparently they're really fascists and not conservatives, but uh, they joined with the so-called liberals and said, uh, oh no, if everybody grew it in their backyard and used it in the living room, it would affect interstate commerce. And there was an immediate backlash. Within two weeks, the DEA had their spokespeople talking to the media saying, uh, we want to make one thing clear. We're not targeting medical marijuana patients. We'll continue to have our focus on the same people it's always been, the large growers and the large sellers. I'm going to skip this, I think. Uh, in terms of clinical standards, I, I think what we have to know as healthcare professionals is all you got to do is practice medicine. There's nothing special here. I mean, this is a medication. You know, you talk to the patients, you get their history, take a look at their medical records, you do a history and physical. You talk to them about how to use the drug. You talk to them about what dosage to take. Talk to them about the routes of administration. Talk to them about the side effects. By the way, what are the side effects? If you're a naive user and if you use a high THC, you might have a panic attack. Might. Very unlikely. Um, and that's about it. If you smoke, you're going to have increased cough, increased sputum production, and irritation of the bronchial tree. That's it. Those are the side effects. Those are the dangers. That's what we've been worried about. Okay. So the Medical Board of California says you've got to have a bona fide doctor-patient relationship, by which they meant, hey, none of this, hello, how are you, uh, give me the money, here's your recommendation, goodbye. That's not a bona fide doctor-patient relationship. Good faith history and physical, again, What's wrong with you? How long have you had it? What other treatment have you gotten? Do a physical examination that at least is relevant to the complaint. Review the patient's medical records. They want to plan with objectives. One of the things that I objected to is in my capacity as medical director of the Medi-Cal Managed Care Program, we had an annual audit by uh, the state health department and the standards that they used were substantially different than the standards that the medical board used for evaluating doctors that were recommending a medication that's one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man. And it's always baffled me. I just think that the medical board is a bureaucracy that's desperately looking for a reason to justify their own existence. So, and I realize I'm, I'm, I'm running over here, and I'm, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up in the next five minutes, is one of the things that we do is because they're worried about children, and the worst thing that we can do f with marijuana if we're worried about children is make it illegal, is I don't think jail is a place for anybody's child. It sure as hell not the place for my child. And the other thing is, which children are using cannabis? And I'll tell you which children are using cannabis. The children that have attention deficit disorder and the children that have post-traumatic stress disorder. So here we are treating somebody with medical disease by sending them to jail. Just doesn't make any sense. And I need to protect myself against the Medical Board of California. I'm a very defensive person by nature. So what, what we do is we kept raising the age, the cutoff age. I mean, I, I, I've seen some teenagers uh, that when their parents are insistent, and I mean, it, it, it breaks my heart. So we usually don't see anybody under the age of 27. 
and we asked them, what's your medical diagnosis, what treatment have you received, and when was the last time you got treated? Now, we're about two miles from the University of California at Santa Barbara, and the word has kind of gotten around on me. I mean, the, the high school that my daughter went to is about uh, six blocks from my office, and she overheard some students, this was seven or eight years ago, uh, talking and saying, uh, talking about getting a recommendation for medical marijuana in California, and they were saying, oh, don't go see Dr. Behrman, he makes you bring in papers. Meaning that they had to have a history of a medical problem before I made a recommendation for medication to treat their medical problem. If you don't have a medical problem, then how can I treat your non-problem, right? So anyway, we get a call, sounds like a sophomore from UCSB, what's your problem? I can't eat and I can't sleep. Uh, what kind of treatment have you gotten? I oh, don't believe in doctors. And we don't make an appointment for them because I'm not going to give them a recommendation. And if I don't give them a recommendation, they're probably not going to pay me. So we don't make an appointment for them. So anyway, they need to have documentation. They need to have a reasonable uh, uh, diagnosis. And we do a, a, a history uh, uh, and, and uh, physical. And, and I think it's important for doctors to keep good records. I, I do expert witness work. And so the doctors at the medical board have gotten after uh, certainly are not practicing great quality medicine. On the other hand, they don't deserve to have their medical licenses yanked. So I discussed the routes of administration. We talked about uh, the various routes of administration, the tinctures, the smoking, the vaporization, uh, sublingual, uh, the oral. Uh, and, and you can use a whole plant tablets, tea. You can use flavored drinks. Strains and dosages, I think that uh, uh, Mara uh, may uh, discuss that, but I usually use as a guideline the dosages that have been found effective uh, in, in regards to uh, Marinol and Sativex. And I found that for a lot of the uh, psychiatric disorders, mental health disorders, two and a half milligrams two or three times a day uh, usually does it. Uh, for sleep, five or ten milligrams. For pain, on the other hand, 15 milligrams is usually the minimum you can get away with as far as getting uh, pain relief. And, you know, with all this excitement about CBD, you don't want to have an excessive amount of CBD over THC if you're trying to treat pain. Uh, in talking to Dr. Deborah Melka of Santa Cruz, she says a one-to-one -one is the, the, the worst or the highest you should, you should go on. Okay, the California Marijuana uh, Cannabis Research Center uh, was founded in 2000. They got nine million bucks. They did 18 studies. At least five of them had to do with pain. They issued a report to the state legislature in 2011. Um, some of you may have heard about Dr. Sue Sicily, who uh, wanted to do a study with VA with PTSD, and to the VA's credit, it only took them four years to approve it. She was going to do it under the auspices of the University of Arizona, and either the Arizona Academic Administration, with pressure from the politicians or the politicians directly, uh, lost the funding for her job. Uh, fortunately, there are other sites where she's now going to do this, and hopefully we'll start treating our uh, uh, soldiers who are defending our freedom the way we should. Uh, Epidiolex, you've heard about that, uh, a high CBD uh, product made by GW. It's being tested in 25 sites in the United States, uh, and we'll see what happens with that. Uh, Dr. McAllister is doing research on breast cancer. Uh, he has done uh, research with mice. I, I think uh, it was alluded to earlier. Uh, I heard Dr. McAllister speak, and uh, all of the mice that got treated with THC, their breast cancer was cured. So if you have a mouse with breast cancer, give them cannabis. Okay, so we've talked about the 20,000 studies, half of them done in the last five years. Um, the academics always try to parse their words. Basically, what the California Medical Cannabis Research Center is saying, it's absurd to have cannabis as a Schedule One drug. I think we can all agree it is absurd. Oh, I thought I had taken that out of there. 
in his autobiography, uh, the President of the United States, Barack Obama, wrote that he used to use marijuana. Uh, I've talked to politicians, and what they mean by that is, the day I decided to run for political office, I stopped smoking marijuana. I used to use marijuana. I also heard, gee, I, I don't know whether I should share this with you, but hey, it's a foreign country, and the uh, United States is uh, allegedly, uh, rumor has it, supposed to be a free country. Uh, one of my patients told me that they were a classmate of uh, the president at Occidental University in Los Angeles, and he was one of the top dopers on campus. Uh, one of my other uh, patients was from Hawaii and said that Barack and his cousin were a good source to go to to buy marijuana. Uh, I don't know whether those things are true or not. Those are rumors. But it's my pleasure to pass them on to you. Uh, because... Barack Obama is not my patient. If he were, then I couldn't have said that. Okay, so we talked about history. You understand the endocannabinoid system a little bit. We talked a little bit about legal. And so what's next? So, okay. We need to follow up in the United States on reclassifying cannabis. We need more research. We need product standardization, and that also means product testing. We need professionalism in growing, dispensing, and prescribing, and we certainly don't have that in California. It's the Wild West. We were the first place to legalize medical marijuana, and I recognize that there are problems there. But I also recognize that there are substantial problems in New Jersey and Washington and Minnesota where the regulations are strangling the effective medical use of cannabis. And that's why I liked what your senator had to say, because he was talking about reasonable medical standards and treating cannabis as an appropriate medicine. So anyway, we've got to label all these, these products, we've got to test them, we've got to standardize them. Uh, dispensaries need to be professional. They probably should be run by a nurse or uh, a uh, pharmacist. We need to do research, more research on cancer, on PTSD, on terpenes. Um, and I just wanted to, oh, yeah, I have to talk about education. We must teach this in medical school. We must require our physicians to get trained, the ones that are already licensed, we need to educate the general public. So insofar, oh, so this is my advice to any public officials that came for the second day. Teach the medical students about the endocannabinoid system. Teach the pharmacists how to make tincture of cannabis. Don't confuse recreational use with medical use. Regulate dispensaries like pharmacies. Recognize cannabis medical value and safety. Um, Rodney Dangerfield was a patient of mine, and I can tell you that because in his book, It Ain't Easy Being Me, which he originally wanted to title My Lifelong Love Affair with Marijuana, uh, he, there's a picture of him looking at a piece of paper, and he's saying, here I am looking at the best piece of mail I ever got, a letter from Dr. Behrman telling me to smoke more pot. <laughs> I didn't really tell him to smoke more pot, by the way. So I want to just read one last thing which came about as a result of uh, yesterday's discussion and then I am out of here. Insofar as the uh, parliamentary efforts, remember that uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You are miles along on your journey and the bill described by Dr. and Senator uh, Dina Towery is but one more step and it's not necessarily the last step. Australians have an opportunity to be a model to the world on the evolution of the reintegration of cannabis as a prescription medicine, as an herbal medicine, as a nutraceutical. You can add your weight to drug policy reform that has occurred in Uruguay, Portugal, Guatemala, the Czech Republic, 23 American states, and the District of Columbia. I'm hopeful that the changes that are about to occur here will put pressure on the United States federal government 
to not only stop being a barrier to cannabis medicinal use, but to embrace it and to fund studies on its medical value uh, and to see spending $20 billion a year, that's what we admit to, to enforce criminal laws unworthy of a civilized society. My final advice to you comes from a plaque that hung in the office of the late conservative Arizona uh, senator and supporter of medicinal cannabis and 1964 Republican presidential candidate, uh, Barry Goldwater, a legitimus non cumberundum. Don't let the bastards wear you down. Thank you very much.